Last year, I attempted the Colorado Trail Race and I quit. It didn't sit well with me at the time and it still doesn't. My time on the trail was hindered with injury and sickness, which I already covered in this video, which you might enjoy if you haven't seen it already. <sighs> Link below. I chalk the experience up to learning and I do have many positive memories, don't get me wrong. But the journey is not complete and failure is never final, so I'm heading back out this year to give it another go. With that said, this video will take you through some changes and improvements and upgrades I've made to both myself and my bike and gear since last year that'll hopefully set me up much better for success this time around. My focus is purely on finishing, maximizing the fun, and minimizing the misery. And if I do it without being slow as molasses, well, that would just be a cherry on top. Let's start with a quick recap of last year's Colorado Trail Race. During the months leading up, I was working long hours while filming Horizon on location in Utah. I was way out of cycling shape and I weighed about 12 to 15 pounds more than I do now. I was getting one or maybe two short rides in on the weekends just to keep my sanity, but again my fitness was lacking to say the least. We finished filming about four weeks out from the Grand Depart and not knowing if or when I'd get another shot at the CTR, I set my sights on it and started training. Over those four weeks, I rode 63 hours, lost a few pounds, and gained back some fitness and confidence that I wasn't hitting it completely off the couch. I was already intimate with the brutality of the route, but I clung to the faint hope that if I could get past the first couple of days, I'd adapt and improve as the ride went on, and even if I was super slow, I'd at least be doing the dang thing, right? Anywho, by the middle of the first day, the altitude was already affecting me, and I was barely able to drink any water or keep any food down. Not good. On the second morning, while feeling incredibly diminished, I crashed my bike during a fast descent, and I broke a rib. In short, I kept pushing on in misery for the next couple of days, hoping I'd heal up and shake the altitude sickness, but it only got worse, and I pulled the plug around mile 290. Again, this video details that journey, and there were still a lot of good times mixed in there, so check it out, I don't want to be a total negative Nelly. So yeah, I've been dreaming and scheming about getting back to the Colorado Trail pretty much since I healed up from that failed effort. The time has finally come, and here's what I've done differently, starting with training. For a route as grueling and demanding as the CTR, I felt the need to show it some more respect by hopefully coming in with much better fitness this time around. Leading up to the race, I've been averaging about 15 or 16 hours of training per week. This includes a mix of structured, high-intensity interval workouts on the indoor trainer with long, lower-intensity outdoor fun rides. I've sprinkled in some hiking with ankle weights and rides that specifically include extended steep terrain that I'm forced to push my bike up, as well as some core strength, push-ups, and overall mobility stuff for good measure. I also added a Wahoo kicker climb to the front of my indoor trainer. I like adjusting the incline to mimic some of the steep grades I'll be dealing with and maybe target those muscles a little better that are so heavily taxed on the Colorado Trail. Almost all of my mountain bike rides involve lots of steep climbs with a fully loaded bike and a fully stocked hydration vest so my body adapts to all the weight and my butt gets used to the extra pressure on the saddle. I've also been wearing the packed out hydration vest on the trainer and I'm feeling less fatigue in my shoulders and neck. Even with the added weight and the loaded bike, I've still been hitting PRs on some local trails and big climbs without totally killing myself. And the numbers from my trainer back this up as well. My FTP has slowly been inching its way up and my average heart rate has been trending down. I've also been doing breathing exercises with an AeroFit, which has increased my lung capacity by over a liter and I can feel myself taking longer, deeper, more efficient breaths. I've always been a mouth breather and I've been working on breaking these habits and utilizing nose breathing more. I've been switching back and forth between the intake breathing system and uh, the turbine that Chris Froome made popular. I like both for different reasons that are beyond the scope of this video, but suffice it to say, they've both helped improve nasal breathing efficiency, especially during zone two efforts. Lastly, I've added in some specific heat training sessions a few times a week, not because I expect it to be excessively hot in Colorado, more so in the hopes that the increased plasma volume, hemoglobin, and cardiac output associated with heat adaptations will benefit me in a similar way that altitude training can. And since I won't have the luxury of getting to Colorado ahead of time to acclimate, I figure it can't hurt. The heat sessions are standalone on top of my normal training rides, I'll jump on the trainer for an hour, fully clothed, 
with a hat and gloves on and no fans or any air circulation. It's actually pretty yucky. I'll hit a steady output that gets my heart rate up to about 70% of max. For me, the Muir workout on Trainer Road happens to be great for this. Like clockwork at about 20 to 30 minutes in, as my core temp hits a threshold and I'm sweating like a pig, my heart rate starts creeping up and it gets tougher to put out the power. I've definitely noticed my sweat rate increasing and since I do the exact workout every time and I wear the same clothes, I can track the progress and slowly increase the output as necessary to keep progressing. Anyway, I guess the moral to the training story is I've been taking it much more seriously than I did last year or that I ever have for that matter. And I've been going with the, if you throw enough spaghetti against the wall, something's got a stick approach. I've also made some subtle changes to my nutrition and hydration strategy. I made a deep dive video about gas station resupply for bikepacking, which I recommend watching if you're struggling with fueling, but here's a few little things to toss into the hopper. First, I'll be adding carb mix to my water. Being able to take in extra calories consistently every time I sip water has been a game changer for me. I focused on this during the AZT 300 a few months ago, which was kind of a mini shakedown of the CTR, and it definitely helped. So I'll be packing some freezer weight Ziploc bags with goo and tailwind powder to get me through the first couple of days. Another positive takeaway from the AZT was packing a bunch of gels for the first day, and I plan on doing that again. I can only stomach isotonic liquid gels, and my favorites are from SIS and MX. They aren't gooey and they go down quick and easy, which is nice when I'm having trouble eating real food. One thing that really saved me on the AZT was pouring soda straight into my bladder when plain water or carb mix infused water started tasting gross to me. I diluted about 50-50 with water and all of a sudden I was drinking more and staying hydrated since it was pretty tasty and palatable and it's packed with sugar. I'll also be focusing on eating and drinking more often especially right out of the gate on the first day. This may seem like a no-brainer, and yes, I have the reminder alarm set on my Garmin, but I have a tendency to get caught up in the ride and I'll neglect the alarm, and then I'll forget to eat until the next time it goes off and it starts to snowball. Or more often, I'll choose to put off eating altogether because I'm in a rhythm and I'm feeling great and I don't want to ruin the flow, or it's not convenient to do without getting off the bike and I get lazy, etc. Then I'll try to catch up later on, by forcing myself to cram down a bunch of food all at once and chug a liter of water, and then I'm really overtaxing my gut. And yeah, it's not ideal, I know. Well, I plan to sip and snack way more often and consistently, even if I have to stop more and break up the flow, I'm gonna do it. And hopefully, that might help ward off altitude sickness as well. Time to geek out just a little bit on the gear. For this year's CTR, I'll be rocking a brand spanking new Niner Rocket 9 RDO, or at least a brand new Rocket 9 frame, along with some other fun upgrades. This has been a long time coming, and I'm super duper excited. Dolphina, my trusty Niner, which has accompanied me on countless adventures over the last six years, is finally officially retired from bikepacking. Recently, she's been living primarily on my indoor trainer, as you might have noticed, and you'll be happy to hear the plan is to tune her up and hand her over to my older daughter, who believe it or not, is now riding the same size bike that I do. Wow. Back to the topic, why did I choose to replace the Niner with pretty much the exact same Niner? Well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The Rocket 9 is a great bike and I can be a creature of habit, so it was easy to go with what I know. And for that reason, I also went with the Fox suspension that I love so much on the old bike a factory float rear shock, and a newer, lighter version of the original 34 factory step cast 120mm fork that I had on Dolphina. The new rocket frame is a definite improvement from the older version as well. The geometry has been updated, most notably a slacker head tube angle, a longer reach, and a longer wheelbase. It's still a beast when it comes to climbing, but it's a little more comfy and confident on steep and techy descents where I'll definitely take all the help I can get. I think it's also slightly lighter than the previous generation. My medium frame with shock weighs in at five pounds, one ounce. It's not the lightest out there, but it's definitely not a fatty arbuckle either. I'm also super happy they ditched the press fit for a threaded bottom bracket and added a few millimeters of travel to the rear shock. So now it's 120 up front and 100 rear. And it employs a SRAM UDH or universal derailleur hanger. So yeah, I put in a few solid shakedown rides with the new Niner and I'm thankful that Black Beauty here will be my companion on the Colorado Trail Race. 
As far as other upgrades and changes to the bike, you might have noticed the wheels. These are the Bird Hawk 27s I got just before the AZT. I featured them in detail in this video, so check that out if you want to learn more. They feature Onyx hook flanged Vesper hubs and We Are One Carbon rims, and I could not be happier. Compliant where you want them, stiff where you want them, super light, super fast, nice and quiet with instant engagement, enough said. The only other kind of big change I made was switching to electronic shifting. After the Arizona Trail Race, my right thumb took a long time to recover from nerve damage, which I associate with all the mechanical shifting. Maybe there was some gunk in the cable housing, and I should have switched out the shift cable ahead of time, but regardless, my thumb took a beating. This go-round, I'm using a SRAM Axis drivetrain, mainly to help with the thumb fatigue, but also because, why not? I chose a GX derailleur and shifter because the extra expense for the Gucci versions simply wasn't worth it to me. And I went with the older Axis versus the newer transmission because I still have Eagle chains and cassettes lying around and didn't want to pony up for the transmission versions. I will note I switched out the stock GX derailleur cage and pulley wheels with an upgrade kit from Ratio out of the UK. You may have heard me mention them before in other videos, and I really enjoy their 12-speed upgrade kit, which I did a long-term review on. Anyway, their CNC'd alloy cage is much lighter than the stock steel cage. How much? Well, my stock derailleur cage with pulleys weighs 145 grams, and the ratio setup comes in at 76 grams, so we're looking at a 69 gram difference. That brings the weight down to about the same as the high-end XO or XX versions. I won't lie, there is a slight bling factor as well. The Delrin pulley wheels are durable, and they're fitted with long-lasting enduro bearings. The whole kit costs about 100 bucks or 90 euros, so if you have a GX axis cage and want to shave a few grams, or you need to replace your pulley wheels, it's worth considering. P.S. They also make cages for mechanical and transmission derailers as well. Other than that, the components and everything else were pretty much transferred over from Dolphina and remain the same as the last time I did the CTR. I'm going with the same forecaster and Cross King tire combo from last time, orange seal sealant, SRAM four piston brakes, metal pads, NV handlebars, a brook saddle, and all that stuff. And I already did a full bike and gear check last year, so peep that if you're looking for all the finer details. Lastly, I'll touch a little on race strategy, <laughs> although I don't really have much of one. I'm not fast, never have been, never will be. That doesn't mean I don't like to push myself and test myself and do what I can to go faster for me. And let's be honest, I'm not getting any younger and I just wanna finish this thing. That's really my only goal. My biggest fear is getting altitude sickness again and feeling miserable the whole time. So I'll be taking the slow is smooth and smooth is fast approach and erring on being conservative and enjoying as much as I can without totally wrecking myself every day. I'll be using a heart rate monitor to help guide my output and keep from overexerting, especially the first couple of days, which linger a bunch around 12 to 13,000 feet. I'm also gonna do my best to sleep and recover at lower elevations when I can. On the CT, low is oftentimes still around nine to 10,000 feet, but I found that even this can make a huge difference when it comes to having an appetite and getting restful sleep. This year, the Grand Depart starts in Denver and heads to Durango. I'm not doing that. I wanna ride the same route as last year, so I'll be heading from Durango to Denver. This means I'll be doing an individual time trial and I'll be starting one day later than the Grand Depart, which allows me to be home for my daughter's violin recital. In my mind, there's a few benefits to doing an ITT in the opposite direction. As I mentioned, I'm not locked into a start date or time, and I didn't have to sweat registering for the GD before it filled up. I won't have the stress of lining up with 75 people in the dark and feeling the pressure of jockeying with them from the get-go and potentially succumbing to weird competitive energy and overcooking myself at the start. Instead, I'll wake up, peacefully make my way to the start, and ride my pace and my race from the get-go. And what I'm really looking forward to is crossing paths with friends and strangers doing the GD and having some fellowship and energizing interactions sporadically along the way. From the fastest to the slowest, even if it's just high fives or quick smiles, I hope to interject positive vibes and encouragement to as many racers as possible and maybe soak up some inspiration from them as well. I'm getting excited just thinking about it. Anywho, I've laid it all out there. This is my plan for tackling the daunting Colorado trail race. Get busy living or get busy dying, right? Will it work? 
Will I succeed? Who knows? All I know is the hay is in the barn and I'm gonna give it my all. Let's go. If you're watching this video soon after I've posted it, I'll be either on my way to Durango or already out there on the trail, and I definitely appreciate your thoughts and prayers for a safe and successful journey. If you're inclined to follow along with the race, you can head over to Track Leaders and check out the dots. There's a totally stacked field at the Grand Apart this year, so I definitely recommend giving it a look-see. I'll put the link in the description. As always, thanks a bunch for hanging out with me, and until next time, ride bikes, give back, pay it forward. Thanks so much for squeezing dirty teeth into your busy schedule. Please help us reach more people and ensure you receive new videos by giving this video a like, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the notification bell. Until next time, ride bikes, give back, pay it forward.